the beginning of this year, I was asked by the vice chancellor and principal of my university to deliver the inaugural lecture, uh, expert lecture of the University of Pretoria. And this is usually uh, the way in which the academic year begins. And I've delivered a lecture against GDP. Um, I'm a political economist by training, so I wanted to show why the most critical number that we use to assess the performance of our countries is fundamentally making us blind to what type of economic development we actually need, both in Africa and South Africa and in the rest of the world. So I really thought that they would expel me after that. I thought really that that would be some sort of, you know, wacky presentation that would look at me like this guy's insane and why would GDP, which seems to be the most important thing you, you, you know, like we, we, we talk about every day and we value it so much, why would that be misleading? And actually at the end of the presentation, people came to me, they wanted to shake hands, take pictures, and they said like, this was a really refreshing presentation. We, we had been having doubts about GDP for so long, but we could never put it in a way that is consistent and structured enough to strengthen our arguments. And there were a lot of business people there as well. And ever since that lecture, I've been invited by a number of business schools in South Africa, companies and other universities, to, to talk about GDP, to say, you know, to explain why GDP is leading us in the wrong direction. Um, you may wonder, you know, like, hey, well, does it really matter that much? It's just a number, but it's not. GDP is much more than a number. It's, it's a metric that influences the way in which we design our societies, the way in which we vote, the way in which we reward our leaders, the way in which we interact with business, the way in which businesses operate, and the way in which we run our lives. And this is making it extremely complicated for us to deal with some of the most critical challenges that you can think of. And, and so I don't know how many of you actually read The Star this morning. There is, a, there is an, an editorial that I wrote explaining why if you change your perspective on what really matters when you're looking at metrics of economic development, then the whole rhetoric of Africa rising which has been with us now for the past three to four years, is actually more uh, tenuous than we would uh, believe. And in, for, in many regards, Africa is not rising. Africa is falling. So thank you for finding the presentation. So the paradox of counting. Let me tell you how the story begins. It all starts with two horses. So the first horse is Clever Hans. I don't know if you've ever heard of Clever Hans. Clever Hans was considered so special at the end of the 19th century because he could count. He could do mathematical operations. And then the second one is Lady. Clever Hans was in Germany, Lady in the UK. Lady apparently could tell the future. And by simply looking at a person, could tell the future about the person. So why does it start with two horses? Because that's when people that doubted the reality of those, apparently, those incredible, these, these, these prodigies, called the auditors. So the auditors were sent in to check whether it was true. And they found out actually that Hans couldn't really count. What he could do, he could actually read the expressions on the face of the people in front of him and sort of understand when the type of answer he gave was right or not by reading the reactions of the people in front of him. And he would count by simply, you know, moving his feet. And Lady couldn't really tell the future. She was simply managing to read the mind of the people in front of her and sort of say what those people wanted to know. So the auditors made it clear that these horses couldn't count and couldn't tell the future. But hold on. Those two horses were then sent to the butcher. And nobody actually pointed out that here you had two horses that could tell, could read minds, could understand the expressions, facial expressions, and in the case of lady, could even spell correctly. Why am I saying this? Because what we look for when we measure makes us blind to things that we don't see anymore, to other important dimensions that may even be more important than what we measure, but we simply don't see it anymore because we're so focused on proving or disproving other theories. And so we miss the forest for the tree. 
here, you know, like depending on how you look at it, do you see a tree or do you see a missing forest? And then we choose what to see. And, you know, depending on what angle, depending on what, you know, like uh, approach we adopt, we see different things. We see either faces or gatherings of individuals and so on and so forth. The audit explosion, probably have heard of, about the audit explosion because you're all part of that explosion. And you know, for those who work at universities like me, it's a simple problem. It's a problem between a principal and an agent. How do you build trust? How do you make sure that you have enough systems whereby the principal and the agent can trust one another? I'm the owner of a company, I employ a CEO, and I create systems whereby I know that the CEO is doing what I would like him to do, or the board, and so on and so forth. Um, nowadays, we measure a lot of things in the audit field. We measure business profit and risk. We measure risk assessment. We measure, you know, like sovereign debt. You know, like there is plenty of audit, auditing done on, on, on sovereign debt. We measure through checklists all possible types of performances. I mean, nowadays, even universities have an exorbitant amount of checklists that people like me have to fill out every day in order to make sure that I'm actually complying with the given standards. Because of the growth of our markets nowadays, we even, you know, like audit carbon offsets. How we trying to tackle climate change requires an auditor to verify that what is actually done is in line with what is expected and so on and so forth. With the expansion of new forms of environmental and climate change related markets, we need more and more forms of carbon, aud carbon audit and so on and so forth. Even auditing for biodiversity in parts of the world in which biodiversity markets have proliferated in the past few years. Um, audit, as the theme of this conference says, has a lot to do with accountability. Assessments project an appearance of neutrality, make you believe that the relationship is to a certain extent devoid of any human or subjective interference, but is it really so? Are really measuring in a way that is neutral, and what does it mean to be neutral in the field of measuring accountability? What standards do we adopt and why? All of these actually make a difference when we operate both in the business, in the private sector, and in civil society. Methods and tools influence our understanding of what matters. And often what falls outside of our methods and tools becomes valueless just because, just like those people auditing the horses, couldn't see the miracle that was happening in front of them and slaughter the animals instead of actually studying what those animals had It was so unique. And what is the relationship between audit and trust? And just a few minutes ago we we're talking about the lack of trust that is you know, um, permeating our societies more and more and how do we make sure that audit can become a way of overcoming that mistrust rather than making it even more, even deeper than it is at the moment. And can we ever overcome our many conflicts of interest when we try and assess the way in which businesses, government, and other type of entities operate and how to make them better? What we measure affects what we do. Um, assessments lead to, in to incentives, and incentives lead to behavior. You know, we teach our students that this is how society operates. But often, wrong assessments create perverse, perverse incentives. And perverse incentives make people behave in a way that is exactly the opposite of what you will want. So assessments really matter. Make our society, make or break our society, if I can say. Let me give you a few examples. School league tables, a form of assessment that has become quite common around the world. Research has demonstrated, and in many cases, schools um, basically play by the form of assessment rather than using it, using the assessment to improve. And they try and trick the assessment in order to show the results that those who assess would like to see. The same applies to different assessments about healthcare waiting lists. In the UK, there have been many cases in which hospitals that have been assessed on waiting lists have simply decided not to, book not to book patients in anymore because that was the best way to make sure that the assessment turned out positive because when you book a, a, a serious patient in, you don't know what may be the, the time that the person will need to wait or the time until the person fully recovers. 
And here is a book by a recent, by a very well-known social psychologist in the Netherlands that simply lied about all his research for 20 years. It's a bestseller nowadays in Europe. This famous professor that published twice in Science, one of the most reputable journals in the world, had to admit that he had lied about all the numbers and the data that he had used in 25 years of his, li of his academic life. And why? Because he couldn't simply keep up with the pressure that was on him because of performance assessments within his own university. He needed to publish more and more, and what he did, the simplest, the shortcut, make up your data. Instead of going out and get the data, make it up and see whether that will, will take you far. And it took him far until he got, you know, like a, until he got caught. Uh, what is the tyranny of the prevailing system of management? I like this, this expression, it's from Dr. Damming. Um, we need to overcome this tyranny by finding ways of looking at the bigger picture. From sectoral to holistic assessments, when we look at companies, when we look at NGOs, when we look at universities, we need to move away from the sectoral assessment, from the silos assessment, and look at the holistic, you know, like the holistic value of a type of institution or organization that we're trying to measure and assess. Assessing success in the long term is fundamental, sounds like like very theoretical and very you know detached from the real world but it's what where the value is the value is in the long-term change and often we sacrifice the long term to achieve short-term objectives companies look good in the midterm they acquire they get a lot of investments and actually two months later you know you realize that we're not good at all i mean think of lehman brothers it was considered triple a plus up until five days before it filed bankruptcy in 2008. We need to rethink rankings as well. What do they really tell us? It's more about you know looking. It's it's a beauty pageant. It's a beauty. It's a beauty context. Or do they really tell us something about good performance and sustainable performance? And finally, we need to move beyond and away from the checklists. No matter how good they are, they force us into a way of measuring and assessing success that is very that is stifling and narrow narrow minded. So what happens when you try to manage, I mean all of you are working in different companies, in different organizations as internal auditors. But what happens when you move away from the company and the organization level and you look at the whole economy? Managing and auditing an economy, a national economy. And here is when my obsession with GDP comes into the picture. Um, GDP is more than a number. It's the most, you know, like powerful way of ordering our societies. Just think after this talk, when you go home, just try and measure or even count how many times you hear GDP when you listen to the radio, when you, when you read the paper, or when you watch TV. It's an obsession. It's a continuous and continuous, you know, like rhetoric on why we need to increase GDP in order to catch up with the rest of Africa, in order to beat Nigeria as the, the largest economy in Africa, and so on and so forth. But let me tell you why I call this number the gross domestic problem. Let me just give you a, a very short history of GDP. I don't know how many of you actually know where the number comes from, but it comes from the 30s, during the Great Depression. Countries, governments were scrambling in order to get a number that could tell them whether their economies were on track to recovery or not. Then the number was used by the United States to plan the Second World War. Why? Because it was a very effective tool to convert the civilian economy into a war economy. That's why GDP became so powerful, because it was good at, mon at um, um, transitioning, uh, helping the economy transition from a civilian economy to war economy. This is why economists consider GDP, the invention of GDP, the Manhattan Project of Economics. It was considered as important as the invention of the nuclear bomb for the Americans to win the Second World War. So here we have a war device that is then transplanted into a governance device, economic governance device. Nowadays, GDP influences the way our governance op operates. Think, for instance, of the European Union. The European Union has a treaty that puts GDP as the foundation of the way in which the European economies have to operate. No countries can operate without respecting GDP parameters, the so-called stability and growth pact. Think of you know, the International Monetary Fund and the World Bank, ever since the 90s, start, went out promoting and training statisticians and auditors in all countries, especially in Africa, to incorporate GDP as part as the key national metric for economic performance. Think of the G8. The G8 is a club of GDP countries. These are the largest economies in the world based on GDP. Your GDP goes down, you're out of the club. 
Think of the G20, it's the same. The biggest economies plus the fastest emerging economies. Your GDP slows down, you're out of it. Think of the BRICS, our beloved BRICS. These are countries, even the acronym of, of the acronym BRIC was invented by Jim O'Neill at Goldman Sachs in 2001, putting together the fastest growing economies in GDP terms, and then South Africa, you know, was added in 2010, later on as the largest economy in Africa in GDP terms. So you lose GDP, you're out of the club. You become a pariah in international relations. But more recently, you know, like con concerns about climate change, concerns about you know, CO2 emissions that make our climate uncontrollable, the environmental impacts of, of um, industrial pollution and so on and so forth, and in also, very importantly, the social impacts of a type of economic development that has made even our households much less resilient than they used to be in the past, has sort of triggered a debate that is questioning whether GDP should be the only measure of economic performance or the dominant measure of economic performance. At the same time, of course, here you have the Great Recession, the fall of Lehman Brothers in 2008, and the recession in which we still are, that has created an opposite debate, that this is not a time to question GDP because all we need is, to, is more GDP so that our economies could go back on track and we can put people to work. So you have this sort of ambivalence in the global debate on where our economies should go. And here is when some politicians like former French President Nicolas Sarkozy, David Cameron, the Prime Minister of the UK, and Obama set up commissions to rethink GDP because they realized actually things were not working that well for them anymore. And here is when it becomes a problem. And even the head of the United Nations, Ban Ki-moon, went on record last year saying that GDP has fundamentally betrayed us because what we need is now a system that puts together social, environmental, and economic development. And he called this new system uh, gross global happiness. But what is GDP? Why is it so problematic? Well, GDP is represented by this equation, which I'm not going to discuss with you because yeah, I understand it's after lunch and mathematics doesn't really help to keep people awake. But it's basically a measure of market consumption, which means that basically it's an amount of money that is transacted in a, in a, in a, in a market, in a formal market, and it's based on prices. What has a price gets counted in GDP. What doesn't have a price doesn't get counted. What is transacted formally gets counted. What is not transacted formally, the odd jobs, you know, like what you buy on the streets, street vendors, and so on and so forth, are not counted in GDP. What are the consequences of this? Let me give you some examples. I have a little kid. I have two options. I can hire a babysitter to come and talk to you guys, and that way I'm actually supporting GDP because I'm paying somebody to do my job and I can come and talk to you. Or I can tell you that I don't have time to come here and I can spend time with my own kids. Some of you may say, you better stay with your kids. You know, it's actually a better thing to do as a father. And in that case, it may be better for the education of my kids and for our family well-being. It may be worse for you because you wouldn't get to listen to me. But it would be also bad for GDP because I'm not, I'm performing the same thing. I'm doing the same thing as the babysitter, but there's no money involved. So if I spend time with my kids, I would be, you know, like uh, not adding to GDP. If I grow my own food and I know what I'm eating and I know it's good and healthy, I'm not helping GDP. But if I go and buy, a, 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 to go to pick and pay or to Woolies or whatever retail in South Africa and buy a plasticky uh, you know, set of food that comes from far away and so on and so forth, then I'm adding to GDP. If I take a walk in the park, I'm not adding to GDP. But if I take my car, gas guzzling vehicle and I go on a safari, then I'm adding to GDP because I'm consuming resources, I'm spending money. Whatever is new gets counted in GDP. What is used doesn't get counted in GDP because it was counted initially, so it doesn't get counted twice. New things are important, used things have to go. And whatever is free doesn't count because it's never priced. And what is the freest thing you can think of? It's mother nature, look at this graph. I mean, you're good with numbers, right? Here you have two curves. One is light gray and it's going downward. And that's the global biocapacity of our planet. So the amount of natural resources that we have. And that has diminished consistently ever since the 60s. And the black upward curve is GDP growth from the 60s until the, the early 2000s. That goes up. So there is a clearly an inverse correlation between how our GDP model and the capacity of our planet to provide the resources that we use every day, the orange juices, the paper, 
the fossil fuels that we use to run our economies and so on and so forth. Nature doesn't get counted in GDP twice. Whatever nature gives to us to run our economies, remember without nature we couldn't even grow a crop. We would starve without the system, the, the, the type of services that nature provides us with every day. So those services have a value. But since they're not contained, they're not included in GDP, they never get counted. And I'll show you what happens when you don't count that. And also, all the bad things that come out of GDP growth, like pollution, environmental degradation, and climate change, do not get counted either. This is why I think we should call GDP the global debt-based Ponzi scheme. I think it's a better term. You all know by now what a Ponzi scheme is. I think Bernie Madoff made my job much easier by giving the Ponzi scheme a global fame. But for a second, think of what happened before the financial crisis of 2008 with the housing bubble in the US. Okay, here we have a house that is considered by economists a capital. We turn it magically into disposable income. So all of a sudden, this house is generating money when it shouldn't. And well, how we do that? We take subprime mortgages on the house. We slice and dice these and we sell it to the rest of the world. And we, ca we call it wealth creation. We call it economic miracle. We call it whatever you want. Then the same applies to GDP. Instead of a house, here we have mother nature. Mother nature is capital. It's depleted, it's not income. Yet we treat it as income. How do we do that? We extract all the resources. We don't care whether they're depleted, whether they're running out. We simply extract as fast as we can. How do we do this? With a number of practices we're very familiar with. And then we turn it into what we call statistical you know, accounting, and we call it GDP, and then we publicize it to the rest of the world as economic growth, as wealth creation again. We do something similar to what we did with the housing bubble. Um, there is another element of the history of GDP that is interesting, and it's called the Frankenstein syndrome, or I call it that way. Here we have two characters. The guy that invented GDP, the Nobel Prize winner Simon Kuznets, and then we have GDP, or the monster. Interestingly, when I wrote the book about GDP, The Gross Domestic Problem, I went to look at what Mr. Kuznets had said when he invented the number. And I found something so interesting, is that this guy already knew all the problems that the number had. He said, be careful because GDP is an average, so luxury at the top can offset poverty at the bottom. Think of South Africa how much of our growth is actually controlled by few people, by a small uh, elite of wealthy South Africans, of which I'm also part, and the rest of the country is not part of that process, and yet our GDP doesn't show the inequality. It also says, be careful because GDP is only counting what is formally transacted, transacted in a market, which means that if you have a country with a lot of informal economy, that doesn't get counted in GDP, gets destroyed by policies that are designed to support GDP. And I remind you that in Africa, 50% of our economies are informal, so they're not counted in GDP. Often they're destroyed by GDP. He said it's based on prices and prices are arbitrary. He said, be careful, a lot of, in a lot of expenses that are included in GDP, including military expenses, that account for about three to four percent of GDP growth every year in some countries are bad expenses. These are things, things we shouldn't have there. And also said, be careful that increasing income is not always good. There are times or levels of income after which the externalities, the negative externalities may actually offset the good things about income. And then he spoke about defensive consumption, which is the type of consumption that you actually do because you want to protect yourself against, for instance, environmental damage. When you buy more air conditioners because the, the, the weather is too hot, but the weather was made hot by the amount of air conditioners that are already out there. So you buy more, you increase GDP by defending yourself against GDP. And finally, he spoke about Quantity versus quality of growth. How many times have you heard a policymaker making a distinction between the quality and the quantity of growth? And he said in 1937 that the most important thing is the quality of growth, not its quality. And he concluded by saying that GDP is a moral judgment. What is included in GDP, how we measure it, is actually subjective. It's not neutral at all. And each generation, around every 10 years, should have a chance to decide what to take out of GDP and what to put back in. But of course, as I've said, GDP was so successful to win the war that the new foot soldiers became all of us, the new consumers. And we were ushered in the age of consumerism, if you will, that started in the 50s and then 60s in the West, and it's now coming to Africa. So the big issue is that, is Africa really progressing? 
Well, depending on what type of performance assessments you uh, choose, then the answer may be yes or no. Let's look at GDP. This is a tale of two curves, okay? Here we have GDP in Africa. Republic of South Africa, 2.6% up. Equatorial Guinea, 5.7. Angola, 6.8. DRC, 7.1. Wow, Chad, 7.3%. Niger, 14.5%. And do you know what is the fastest growing economy in Africa in 2012, which is the only year for which we have the data so far? Does anybody want to venture in an answer? You wouldn't know, you wouldn't think about it. It's Libya, 129% GDP. Never before a country managed to grow so fast. As I say to my students, when you have a war and there's only one brick left, even building another brick is 100% growth. So it's actually, it's not an enviable um, uh, record. But what if we look at the consumption of natural resources, just to look at the consumption of non-renewable resources, and then we subtract this from GDP, right? That's what any management a uh, serious manager would do, right? We're looking at the income, we subtract how much we have invested, and we get the profit, right? Well, then the curve goes down, very steep. The Republic of South Africa has lost 3.45% of its wealth, so it's gone negative in 2012. Equatorial Guinea lost more than a third of all its wealth so far. Angola, more than 40% of its all wealth, so it's actually, instead of growing, it's going negative and Chad, 49%, and uh, the top of the list is the DRC with minus 57%. Here, look at this. This is a graph from the Africa Progress Panel, so the Coffee and Nan group. Okay, look, the yellow bars are bad news. That's how much of our GDP in Africa is accounted for by extractive practices. So fossil fuel, minerals, and so on and so forth of non-renewable uh, resources, okay? In Equatorial Guinea, over 50%. In Nigeria, over 20%, and so on and so forth, okay? I don't know how much of this you can see, but it's definitely, there's a lot of yellow there. And we also know that actually all the countries that have grown so far, with very few exceptions, have grown unequal. So GDP growth um, is correlated with rising inequality in countries that grow, especially those that grow fast. Here, there's a graph that compares the growth of GDP, the black curve, with the growth in inequality, the blue curve. And there is a perfect correlation between the two of them, an amazing correlation. Here, there's a report by the OECD about all the data on income distribution and poverty, titled Growing Unequal. Here, another one, Divided We Stand, Why Inequality Keeps Rising with GDP Growth. So, and here, look at this. This is the distribution in Africa, again, of the wealth controlled by the 10 top, 10% 10 top, the top 10%, and which is the yellow bars, and the wealth of the poorest 10%, which is the red bars. Look at the discrepancy between those who have and those who have not. It's, it's exorbitant, it's incredible. And of course, South Africa again tops the list with more than 51.6% in the hand of the top 10%. This is what happens when GDP grows. Um, if you think of Africa has, as a continent, with the tip of the iceberg is what is measured by GDP, which is the formal economies that are part of the market. And then underneath that thing, you have a set of different types of economies, different types of forms of production that are informal, they're based on the households. And that, the part of the continent is not visible. By supporting GDP, we're reducing all of those and eventually we're losing what really matters about our, about, our, about our continent. Have you heard, I probably have heard about the Chinese miracle. Everybody talks about China these days. A lot of people that seldom go to China because if you go to China, you wouldn't talk so highly of China, not because there's anything wrong with the Chinese people, just because there is so much pollution, you can hardly see the Chinese. Is there are some pictures that are quite telling. I mean, you know that China has the fastest train on earth, if you can see it, because it's right behind the second picture, right behind the smog there. And some of the tallest skyscrapers in the world, again, if you can see them. This is a picture taken from the satellite and looks at man-made uh, pollution in China. It's the gray, the gray clouds. It's something really scary. And here is a study published by The Lancet, the leading medical journal in the world, that says that one, two point million people die in China every year for pollution-related causes. Here is Airpocalypse, 
the Financial Times talks about Eric Apocalypse affecting, you know, like life in Beijing. And here is an interview I had with the Vice Minister of the Environment in China. He says, this miracle will end soon because the environment can no longer keep pegs. Environmental damage has cost China 8 to 15 percent of GDP per year without considering the depletion of resources. Our country has lost almost everything it has gained since the late 1970s due to pollution. So he's saying to us that the Chinese miracle is a statistical mirage. By not looking at the costs of GDP growth, we believe we're getting richer, but when we start paying for the bill, we're gonna end up much poorer than we started with. But do you know which one is the, the most polluted air in the world? With bank. Actually, we think of China, but the dirtiest air in the world is just 130 kilometers east of Johannesburg in the new city of Amaladeni, formerly known as Bit Bank, the White Bank, I think it, it means in Afrikaans. Well, it's not that white anymore, if it, were, if it ever was. But the good news is that there, there is a growing group of critics of GDP, so I'm not alone in the world, which is good, which makes me feel much better. Um, some of these people used to be worshippers of GDP up until a few years ago, but as I say, there is ne it's never too late to change your mind, especially if it comes when we all need it. Uh, the groups are, can, we can divide these people into two groups. Those who would like, would like to reform GDP because it's a poor assessment measure. And these include the OECD, the European Union, the World Bank, the United Nations, those who promote the inclusion of dashboards, the green GDP proposed by the United Nations Development Program, and the GDP plus ideas. And this, then those a bit more extreme that would like to replace GDP altogether. So do away with GDP and, and invent new measures. And here we have the gender and progress indicators, the gross national happiness in Bhutan, and a number of indexes of well-being around the world. And some of these pictures are of those who increasingly criticize the famous people that increasingly criticize GDP. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, I wrote a notepad for the Mailing Guardian, in which I argued something simple. I argued that if Nigeria was to overtake South Africa as the largest economy in the continent, that wouldn't be a good thing for Africa because the Nigerian economy is way less sustainable than the South African one. The South African is pretty bad, but the Nigerian one is even worse. So my argument was, if we keep looking at GDP, we get a, the wrong picture. And we think that Nigeria would be a better player nowadays. A lot of people say Nigeria would be better than South Africa as a leader. Well, if that means following the example of Nigeria so far, that wouldn't be a good thing for Africa. So here is my notepad for the mailing garden. A day after, I get a call from a Nigerian newspaper. And I got freaked out. I thought, hey, God, these guys are gonna tell me I'm a persona non grata in Nigeria. How dare I say something so negative about the Nigerian economy? No, the guy said to me that he wanted to publish my article on the first page of his, of his newspaper in Lagos. And I was like, oh, wow. I said, look, you cannot believe how many people in my country are questioning GDP these days. It's becoming something really relevant here, too. And here is the page that was eventually published on the Premium Times in Nigeria. The good news is also that there is an increasing change from below. So there is hope. There are businesses out there, there are civil society organizations that are trying to rethink GDP at the micro level. While governments still hesitate, they are trying to make a difference. I presume often helped by internal auditors that have a more long-term understanding of success. Because of, you know, running out, because energy is running out, the whole idea of peak oil, nowadays you see more and more groups that are trying to talk, that try to analyze whether we want more growth and for what. They speak about transitioning from a form of economy that is heavy on fossil fuels to a to type of economy that is low on carbon or even carbon neutral. They talk about prosumerism. They try and set up cooperatives where people produce and consume their own food. Anathema for GDP because what you cook for yourself, even though it makes you healthy, is not as good as when you go to Mr. To Mr. Delivery to buy something which counts for GDP. And they set up cooperatives in which people can exchange food, can you know, go back to forms of exchange of important commodities that otherwise they wouldn't have access to. They produce their own energy. Some of these pictures I've taken from groups as far as Canada, Alaska, India, Philippines, and South Africa itself. Here are some you know, like numbers. 
And some of these groups are also rethinking the role of money, you know, like what money is for. And for instance, building new forms of money, which I find really interesting, something that we should look at. You know, like not against money per se, but like what money do we want? What is it for? And creating money that people can exchange without, you know, like an interest free with different forms of exchange that are really, really interesting and quite innovative. And here is a quote from one of the founders of the most well-known alternative currency in the US. Paul Glover, who says, national currencies are crumbling because they're all in debt with nature, since modern human economies extract from nature faster than they replenish. Local currencies are capable of reconnecting our economies to our planet. And I think what these people are doing in different ways, with different forms, a lot of them are micro enterprises, are finding a new space for people to rethink GDP, to rethink growth as the ultimate goal of our societies, or at least the type of growth we've seen so far. Rethinking growth, reimagining a type of growth we would like, whether it's more inclusive, whether it's green, whether it's even more sustainable than we can imagine. Well, who are the winners and losers in the GDP system? The winners so far have been especially the polluting industries. Why do I say that? Because as I've said, GDP doesn't count the bad things. It only counts the money that is produced. So if I produce energy from coal, you're going to see the amount of energy that comes out of my uh, plant and how that impacts your, 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 uh, your company, your family, and so on and so forth. You never count the amount of money that will be needed to clean up the mess. Now, we know that the coal industry, for instance, I hope there are not many people working in the coal industry here, but the coal industry is by and large a negative business it actually costs more than it produces because the costs of cleaning up are higher than what is the wealth that is being generated. And yet they get a facelift because GDP doesn't measure that. Um, big consumption mechanisms, of course, are, have been the winners. And every time we hear that we need to spend and spend and spend more, no matter, they don't care about what, how we spend our money. What matters is that we spend our money because our, otherwise our economies would grind to halt. Can you believe our economies stop immediately for every three months if we don't spend? What type of economies are these? How resilient can an economy be if it grinds to halt every three months if, if the consumers don't go on a shopping spree every weekend? Financial markets have also gotten a, 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 a free ride with, with GDP because they've become the main allocators of resources because they know best, because they know best how to invest. They know best how to run the economies and we've seen what happened. And finally, a system of technocracy that has been um, in, you know, influencing our governments. And more and more nowadays, the economic policies are you know, like designed and implemented by technocrats, no longer by people that are accountable to the citizens, but people that know the business. You know, those who know best, don't interfere with them, let them do their job. You know, like, don't try to be accountable. They know how to increase GDP, so forget about it. Let them do their job and it's gonna be good for everybody. And the losers have been democracy, first of all, lack of accountability. We have no say over the final trajectories of our economies. We have lost control of what type of economic policies we really want. Secondly, the gift economy, the informal economies, those economies that are not counted in GDP and that matter, 50% of the economies in Africa are not counted in GDP, are part of the informal sector. All of those are discounted and often simply replaced with conventional economic systems. The most visible example, it's telling street vendors to get out of the way and build a shopping mall. That is happening every day in South Africa because street vendors are not it can, are not good for the economy, shopping malls are. But the difference is that street vendors often cater for the poorest. And when you build a shopping mall where there used to be a street vendor or an open market, the poor, the poorest will no longer have their food, will no longer have access to, their, um, to the goods that they used to buy. Also, the whole household services, you know, like this is a technical term, which means what we do for ourselves. The time we spend with our kids, how the economic impact of having people, parents, that spend more time with their families, it's huge. You know, if we had parents leaving their kids from very early in the morning until late in the evening, that would be a huge economic cost for our societies. One reason why we have 
uh, you know, like resilient economies these days is because families manage to provide those services that society, society, society couldn't. But if we make these people work more and more, longer hours, at some stage we're going to have to pick up the bill. And the bill will be extremely, extremely expensive. Leisure options have gone out of the, uh, out of the way, uh, out of the window, and of course, modern nature. So to conclude, what we need is a, an alliance, a cross-border alliance involving a lot of people like you that work in organizations and businesses in nonprofits and in different types of corporations to rethink what economic performance is, to rethink what success really is in the 21st century, because we're still stuck with an idea of success that comes from the 20th century. Uh, Milton Friedman once said that a company's only social responsibility is to increase profit. I would say that nowadays nobody agrees with that anymore, thank God. So we've done away with that one, right? We've told Mr. Milton Friedman that that, that is no longer good in the 21st century. And we have, we have created a new um, sort of paradigm called corporate social responsibility. We agree that corporations, businesses, all types of productive activities have a social responsibility. Now I believe we have to move beyond even that one to have a transformative transition towards a new system in which we really rethink the ultimate goal ultimate role and goals of business. Is it just about social responsibility or is it about creating integrated sustain sustainable mechanisms within, which, within the way in which businesses operate? And only auditors can do that because you are those that tell your bosses whether you're achieving the goals. And if the goals change, a lot of things will change as a consequence. Do we still want a type of economy that puts kids into trolleys when we go shopping and we fill up our trolleys every time with hyper consumption levels? Those who can and those who can't starve, do we still want these type of companies that are digging seven, eight, 20 kilometers under the ground, putting people at temperatures that are above 50 degrees in order to create wealth? Is this the 21st century economy we want for our children? Do we still want to produce energy in a country with so much sun through this type of coal-fired plants? And do we still want to have this type of mobility system you know, in which you get stuck on the N1 every single day for hours and hours? You know it very well. I mean, I live in Pretoria, so it couldn't be get worse than coming from Pretoria to Joburg in the morning. And how do we combine the wealth of our nat natural resources with the type of development that we have chosen for ourselves? What better measures we need? We need more measures of what happens in the households. You need to help us with this. You need to find ways to measure what is not captured by conventional statistics. Households that crumble mean a society that crumbles. Then you wonder why you have so many rapes, so much child abuse. There is destitution going on in our households and we don't know it because it doesn't get captured by GDP and we don't care. We simply don't know what's going on, how they use their time, how much money they have, how they interact with one another. These are important statistics that we need to know. What type of work we want? You know, how do we build a system that affords decent work to a lot of people? How, what type of education we want? You know, like how do we distribute and redistribute in a way that overcomes the gap between the wealthy and the poor? And finally, how do we create systems that are compatible with life on our planet? And how do we build a system that is for well-being, good health, healthcare, and other things that we seem to have lost entirely? So, and this would allow us to reclaim Africa in the end. You know, I told you it was a small, small continent, but if we manage to change, to reverse the process, we may be able to get Africa back on track. Thank you so much. Here is my website, my blog, my Twitter account, my book. Please write me, especially if you disagree with me, because I'm always very happy to see different viewpoints that allows me to improve my, uh, my, my approach, my thesis, and hopefully to, get, to do a better job next time I talk. Thank you so much. Thank you, Prof, for such a comprehensive and empowering uh, presentation. I'm not going to start presenting again your presentation, believe you me. Uh, is there any question from the back for Prof? Yes, we've got three questions. In opposing GDP and in normalizing the informal sector, how do we then continue to maximize tax revenue for state ex expenditure? Okay, so um, that would mean a good thing. It would mean a lot because I've, most of these activities are these days not taxed. So it actually 
if there was a way of measuring the, if the idea was that we needed to somehow get a sense of what is happening in the informal economy so as to be able to value that contribution more directly, there could be two options. One is that to create policies that support the informal economy and then identify systems perhaps to uh, collect taxes on the informal economy. Some of these systems already exist. Some of these informal, in, in the formal sector in other countries, for instance, pays a, a, um, a fixed amount of tax regardless of the income. So that you pay a fixed amount of tax in order to be able to operate and then regardless of income, you're still contributing to the welfare of your nation. So, but what matters is that we find ways of knowing how much of that economic contribution is helping our economies, is strengthening our societies. Once we know that, we could decide not to tax them, or we could decide to include taxation uh, policies that are in line with the way in which the informal economy works. In either case, it's a good thing for the economy. Second question. What measures do you believe should replace GDP? Yeah, uh, but well, it's, it's my, I think, second to last slide. Uh, we need measures of what really matters. It's very simple. GDP was invented to win the Second World War. The Second World War was won. No reason to continue using GDP. I mean, how many things are invented in a war that are not a good fit for in peacetime? Right? A lot of things that are good for a war are a bad thing for peace. So GDP was invented for a purpose. The purpose was achieved, done. Now we have to ask ourselves a very simple question, what my son would ask me. Dad, what type of economy do we want to live in? And then we say, well, we want to live in an economy where families and households are strong. Because we know that when households are weak, society has to pay the price. Even if we don't care. I make this, I want to get this clear. Even if we don't care about the poverty, even if we don't care about you know, injustices and so on and so forth, we pick up the bill. When there is a crime committed, it costs our country. When there is a woman raped, it costs all of us. When we have you know, types of destitution that make people sicker, we have to treat those people. There is a lot of research that has demonstrated that all these costs are enormous. So we cannot simply forget about it. You know, whether we like, whether we care or not, okay? This is more about self-interest, if you will. So, we want a type of economy that is strong. A strong economy cannot be achieved without strong households. So we need to find forms. And I'm telling you that Statistics South Africa is already including new surveys of households because they got it right. They understood that it's important. But we cannot have a sound economy without strong households in which we understand how income is distributed, what, you know, what type of services are rendered at the household level, and we build policies for people to strengthen that. Some of these policies may even say that you are allowed as a woman to stay at home for longer when you get pregnant, when you, give, when you give birth, because we know that if you stay for, instead of three months in South Africa, if you stay for six months, that actually has a positive economic contribution to our economy because your children will be healthier and what you do in your house will be better for your own family and your community. Nowadays, it's the other way around. When a woman spends three months for maternity leave away from work, it's considered an economic loss. It's like, hey, you better come back to work because you're, you know, like you're not being helpful to the economy. It could be very much the opposite if we're looking at the holistic picture. And then, as I've said, what really counts? We need to get education. Mr. Mandela told us that there is no development without education. And this country, in spite of all its wealth, is letting uh, schools down. It's having one of the most dysfunctional education systems in the world. So these are some of, and importantly, final, we need to measure what gets depleted in the economic production process. We cannot, any manager would tell you that profit is uh, investment minus, uh, sorry, income minus investment, right? GDP tells you the opposite, that you don't have to worry about the investment, just looks at what is coming out of the process. So, but what if we invest $20 billion in coal or in oil that is depleted and we get only $20 million out of it? We're losing, right? And actually, GDP doesn't tell us that. So we need to find new measures to measure the ecological and also the economic value of the things that are necessary for our economic development that are not renewable, that will run out at some stage. If you take the GDP measurement out, I'm assuming that's remove it, Will the G8 and like groups still exist, or would we create new groups in the world? Wouldn't that be beautiful? 
I mean, like, imagine for a second, close your eyes and imagine a world that is not run by those powers, but by other powers. Imagine a system of governance that instead of having the most polluting countries in the world calling the shots, has the greenest countries in the world paving the way for us to follow in their footsteps, right? Why can't we have that? Why do we give so much credit to countries that have no authority, have no credibility? How can you believe that the G8 countries or the G20, I'm sorry that South Africa is part of it, oh, the BRICS, even worse. You know, like how can you believe that these groupings of countries that have espoused the model of development that is bad for the planet and bad for their own citizens can tell us how to move into the new century? It'd be great. I don't think that would ever happen, but it'd be beautiful if when we change GDP, as a consequence, we would have a new G8 made up of the Sweden or the Costa Ricas or, you know, of the world. And a new G20 made of the countries that have really managed to find, you know, to put well-being at the center of their policies. I think that would be a wonderful governance system. And I wish that my children, your children, were to live in that type of world. Thank you.